Well, it's been a quiet week in the British news, at least concerning Israel, because there hasn't actually been much reported. I suppose there have been a few other things which have rather taken news headlines. But that's unusual, actually. In fact, I suppose two weeks ago, it must be now, the Israeli elections were on, so certainly that got reported. And it's a very rare thing these days for something not to be in the news from around the land of Israel. And the point of saying that at the outset was to say to you that um, in 1848 that wasn't so much the case. Um, the land of Israel was part of the Ottoman Empire, you can see marked in various shades of ground depending on its different extents, which had been a huge empire. One stage had come right across, uh, at least Islam had actually reached right up into Spain in the early Middle Ages and even in uh, the 17th century it got right to the gates of Vienna. So the Ottoman Empire had controlled this area for a very long time. There were a few visitors, uh, I rather like this, there are a lot of pictures, no photographs of course at the beginning of this time in 1848, uh, but there are watercolours and such like of tourists who've been there. And this is tourists uh, visiting pilgrims, because most of the tourists were people who were interested in the Bible and Bible places. Landing near Joppa, I have to say, it looks a bit uh, dangerous to me. Uh, rowing your way through those rocks looks rather hazardous. And that's the ancient city of Joppa in the distance behind them. And when those pilgrims and uh, visitors came to the land, they found it uh, very little change from how it might have been in the time of Jesus because uh, it was poorly governed, it was thinly populated, not much had changed for centuries. <laughs> this is a watercolour of Jacob's well at Sychar, the a white building, you might be able to see it on the right hand side of the picture as you looked at that, it is the uh, building covering where the actual site of Jacob's well was supposed to be. But I don't suppose the landscape looked terribly different from how it might have done for a very long time. In 1848, the land was very sparsely populated. Uh, it's difficult to get exact estimates, but the best ones we have are about 300,000 people, including, and this might be a bit surprising, about 25,000 Jews. Uh, the largest group in Jerusalem, but also in one or two other historic centres. So they'd always, in fact, almost continuously from the time of Jesus, been a small number of Jews, sometimes a very small number of Jews, in the land. Um, mostly in those centres that are most associated with their religious beliefs. Very badly governed. The, the, the Ottoman Empire was sometimes called the sick man of Europe. And it was a poor government. It didn't uh, govern very effectively. Uh, Constantinople, Istanbul was a long way away. And uh, much of the land had been neglected. It was dry, it was rocky, it was poorly cultivated. And one of the things which was interesting about the Ottoman Empire was that it was a, a, a travel, a common travel zone. So if you can imagine how the European Union mostly is now, although interesting enough, even before we've left, if we do, which I think we might, uh, even before we've left, actually the, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, guards on the French and English borders have rather increased lately, rather than decreased. But in this kind of free movement area, right across from Turkey, Lots of people from different areas wandered about the countryside or, or travelled about the countryside um, without much uh, interference. So there were Syrians, Persians, Germans, Afghans, Armenians, Kurds, Circassians, all sorts of people. And there was no particular border which marked out the extent of what we know as the land of Israel today. The other thing which is interesting, 1848, <laughs> nobody called themselves Palestinians. <laughs> I came across this very interesting um, uh, graph here, and the blue line shows the references to Palestine. And you can see, this is in literature, this is in, in, in books uh, published, I don't know how exactly it was arrived at, but it's a very interesting graph. But you can see hardly any references uh, to Palestine until about 19, 1940s, when it became much more commonly described as such. Uh, hardly any mention of Palestinians, in fact the Palestinian line you can see is the red line at the bottom there. And the interesting thing is it's not until about 1963 
when people began to describe the Palestinians. Now, those of you with very long memories might remember that that was a time when the Palestinian Liberation Army began to hijack aeroplanes and fly them to various places in Jordan. And from that time onwards, they began to call themselves Palestinians. I read a rather interesting um, document about this not so long ago from a Jordanian who'd been alive from this time and complained bitterly that he'd always been a Jordanian until everybody told him he was a Palestinian. And he rather objected to being told he was a Palestinian because he didn't think he was. He was a Jordanian. And he didn't identify himself in that way. So, in 1848, certainly nobody particularly would have talked about Palestinians. They would have recognized the name Palestine, but not Palestinians. In 1848, and for a little time before, it had been a very neglected place. So, a certain Count Volney in 1760 visited, and he says he meets with, the traveller meets with nothing but houses in ruined cisterns, very important because they contain water, for watering the ground are rendered useless, and not surprisingly, as a result, the fields abandoned. The second one there from 1860, I find quite astonishing. In 1860, the traveller found there was not a single boat of any description on the Sea of Galilee. Now, even if you missed one or two, to be in a situation on the Sea of Galilee where in Jesus' time, certainly, there would have no doubt been hundreds of boats, uh, and finding every single boat is quite extraordinary and shows the extent of the neglect. The last longer passage there is actually from the American author Mark Twain, who went there in 1867. Look what he says Nazareth is for law. Jericho lies a mouldering ruin. Beth Bethlehem and Bethany, in their poverty and humiliation, have nothing to remind one they once knew the high honor of the Saviour's presence. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes desolate and unlovely. So it was a neglected land, it was a poorly cultivated land, and um, despite some attempts by Palestinian historians to look lately to challenge this, the overwhelming evidence is actually that this was in fact the case. This is an interesting picture, again a watercolour from the time from, uh, uh, well, this early, 1820. And you see merchants there on the outskirts of uh, Hebron, uh, resting, some perhaps trading with each other, and again, probably the scene would not have looked very much different hundreds and hundreds of years before that time. The large building you can see in the centre of the picture, at the top of the picture, is actually the burial place of Abraham, uh, because that was even then uh, a famous uh, place to visit, a shrine. Now, one of the things which people don't always appreciate is that in 1840, the Jews are the largest single group in the population of Jerusalem. Now, this is interesting because Palestinians, not very long ago, were demonstrating to say Jerusalem's our city, it always has been. That isn't actually true. In 1840, out of 16,000 estimated population, 7,000 were Jewish. So that was the largest single group. Christians, about 3,500, Muslims, about 5,000. Um, so, even then, uh, there was quite a, an interesting Jewish presence, particularly in Jerusalem, but also in some other cities. So, in 1848, this was a very quiet backwater. And what we're going to see in the rest of my talk is how that situation was transformed in direct fulfillment of the passage which we're now going to read, our reading from Ezekiel 36. So we'll have that reading now, please. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has said of you, Aha, the ancient sites have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you are taken up by the lips of talkers and slandered by the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, and the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations, 
and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession, with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds, in order to plunder its open country. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the stone of heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Now this is a very remarkable prophecy, and all the more so, because when it was originally given to the prophet Ezekiel, the city of Jerusalem was being destroyed. And the temple there, which Solomon built, was being destroyed. <coughs> So this was a time of catastrophe for the Jewish nation. And yet out of this catastrophe comes this wonderful, wonderful prophecy, not only in chapter 36, but also 35 and 37, uh, of how God would restore the nation of Israel. So let's just have a quick look at the particular promises or prophecies which we've just read about. So the first one was going to happen pretty immediately, that the land of Israel would be uh, taken over by their enemies, the land would become desolate. That not only happened at that time, to a degree, but later on, even more so, particularly after the time of Jesus, at the time of the Romans, when they revolted against the Romans in AD 68 to 72, and afterwards. So the land became desolate because the Jews who had originally been given this land by God would be expelled from it to a large degree. Never completely, but to a substantial degree. 
But then what did you read? We read that the Jewish people said this prophecy, returned to the mountains of Israel, and their God would make them fruitful and prosperous. Very clear that from what we read, wasn't it? And then we read that God would bring the Jews back from wherever they had been, I'm going to bring you back, says God, from every place where you've been scattered, and I will bring you back to this land. This is the place to which you'll be regathered. And God's power, said the prophet Ezekiel, or God through the prophet Ezekiel, would be clearly shown. They shall know, it's one of the most common phrases you find in the prophet Ezekiel, they shall know that I am the Lord when this happens. So this is a guarantee, says God. If these things come to pass, he says, then you will know that I am the true God and these promises I've made have been fulfilled and will be fulfilled. <clears throat> then of course there's one more, which we'll come to a little bit later, about the final restoration of God's people to worshipping God in the right way. And the remarkable thing is that these prophecies about the restoration of God's land have been fulfilled uh, since 1848. Now, something always astonishes me. There are so many references in God's word to the regathering of the people of Israel as a sign of the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ that it's pretty astonishing to find it so rarely referred to in churches around us today. So what, what's happened there? Because it's always been obvious. In fact, actually, not just Christadelphians, which has a community ever since 1848, indeed perhaps a bit before that, have strongly believed in the fulfillment of these prophecies uh, about Israel and the gathering of Israel, but other people as well, in days when Bible <coughs> reading was rather more commonplace. So here's a passage from a certain David Austin from 1799. The whole house of Israel after long captivity shall be restored again. When God shall begin to live in his people, there will be a state of impenitence, disposed rather to continue among the Gentiles than return to their own land. But the Almighty will so dispose events that they shall be put in motion towards their restoration. So not a Christadelphian, indeed I don't know exactly what, what uh, David Austin was. But he read his Bible and comes to the same conclusion. Likewise, the famous 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon, who at one time preached to 3,000 people at a time without amplification, so he must have a really good voice, <laughs> um, and, and uh, enthralled them by his preaching, preaching sometimes for an hour at a time. He, he comes to exactly the same conclusion because he'd read these passages. Also certain, Jews of the people will yet own Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, as their king, and they will return to their own land, and they shall build the old waste, raise up the former desolations, repair the old cities. There will be a native government once again. Why did he say that? Because you read it here. In other passages, in the prophecy of Jeremiah, and many other places in the Old Testament. And, of course, the uh, sort of founding uh, literature of the Christadelphian community was a book called Elk is Israel, the Hope of Israel. And that set out to set out in detail God's purpose through the promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all these prophets which we've just been looking at. There it is, the same kind of thing before the second coming. Colonization of Palestine will be on purely political principles. They will return in unbelief in the messiahship of Jesus as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth. And this is a bit I like. The restoration of the Jews is a work of time required between 50 and 60 years to accomplish. Now, how does he know that? Well, he didn't know about the 50 or 60 years. That was an estimation. But it's a very interesting estimation. Um, but the rest of it was from reading the Bible carefully. Because it's obvious when we read the Bible, this is what it's saying. So, John Thomas... Christadelphian, 1848, <coughs> thought it might be 50 years. So it was a bit longer in the end. But it's interesting to see what happened in those next 50 years. Because, as I said, God would determine what was going to happen. There were lots of Jews across lots of parts of Europe, and in many places they were very comfortable. Some of them were very well off indeed. Others were very poor, but some of them were very well off. They thought of themselves, many of them, as Germans and Frenchmen and Englishmen and other parts of the European continent. Um, but what happened in the next 50 years 
was that a nasty form of anti-Semitism, which had always been there in the background, surprisingly, when you think we're talking about the 19th century, and you might have thought it would be a bit more civilized, began to spread quite virulently in many parts of Europe, especially in the east of Europe. So lots of Jews suddenly found that their sometimes centuries-long existence in parts of Europe was being disturbed. There's lots of detail on this map, and I won't go into all of it, but you'll notice the shaded area in what's now Poland and Ukraine and uh, the area towards Europe from Russia. And from that shaded area, about two million Jews fled from Russia because of persecution. And they fled, most of them went to America. This is one of the reasons why there's so many Jews in America today. Um, but also, elsewhere in Europe, there were various anti-Semitic events. So, even in Britain, there were anti-Jewish riots in 1911. Um, in Germany, various incidents, anti-Semitism supported by many intellectuals, an anti-Semitic league, an anti-Semitic party, synagogues burned by mobs. Likewise, in places in Austria, strong anti-Semitism. And particularly in France, a very famous case of a, 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 a uh, French uh, Jewish uh, officer called Alfred Dreyfus, mm -hmm. who was falsely accused of betraying secrets to the German state, military secrets. And he was arrested, put on trial, and was found guilty. He was sent to Devil's Island off the, north, off the South American coast. And it wasn't until some years later, the long campaign, that he was found not to have been guilty at all and that somebody else had been betraying these secrets. The interesting thing is that there had been a, a, an Austrian journalist covering the case. So we'll come to that Austrian journalist in a little while. So lots of persecution of Jews, and it's getting worse. And the settled existence, which particularly German Jews had had, began to be, be disturbed by these things. And some Jews began to think, well, we better leave. As I said, most of the early ones went across to America. What happened in the next 50 years? Well, also at the same time, it may seem strange today, well, I suppose at least Theresa May goes to church, but in the 19th century, particularly the early 19th century, many politicians have been brought up with some degree of Bible knowledge. So famous politicians like Lord Shaftesbury, the famous social reformer responsible for uh, getting children out of factories and mines, uh, Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister, currently starring in Victoria, if you watch it on Sunday evenings, um, although he was a bit of a rake in other respects, uh, actually was interested in this as well. Benjamin Disraeli, who himself was Jewish, but converted to Anglicanism in order to be stand in Parliament and eventually became Prime Minister. George Eliot, from not very far away from me, down uh, by Nuneaton, and Paul McHunt, the artist, and Lord Kitchener, the famous uh, recruiting poster man, your country needs you. All of these were interested in the return of the Jews to Israel because they'd been brought up to understand something of the Bible and picked up some of this from what they'd learned. So although sometimes their understanding was a bit mixed, nonetheless, they had some basic understanding and appreciated that this was part of Bible prophecy. And there were also quite a few very wealthy Jews, the Montefiore family, the Rothschild family, both famous for, for banking circles, and they began to say, well, we want to help some of our people who are being persecuted, they want to go back to Israel because they think it will be safe there, we'll help them. So little settlements were set up from place to place. And the Christadelphian community, because it was sympathetic towards the Jewish uh, situation, and it actually helped relieve um, suffering as a result of persecution, uh, one of the things they did was fund a settlement in, in uh, Yano in Upper Galilee in the 1880s, and I gather the settlements uh, still there under a different name today. So in a very small way, exactly what Ezekiel had told from God, I'll take you from the nations, gather you from all the countries, and bring you into your own land. In a very small way, it was beginning to happen. It happened steadily over that next 50 years. But having said that, most of the country was still very poor and developed. So when photography came along, there's a picture of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem in the 1870s, and these strange people, the Jews, not very many of them, as you can see. 
There's an interesting thing, by, by the way, about the way that you walk. I was fortunate enough, when I was uh, only about 15, to go and see it. This is when it was still in Jordanian hands. The city of Jerusalem, Jordanian hands. The interesting thing is, the way it walked had a passageway no further than about from here to the wall. It was the width of the passageway. And on the other side were old houses. And when the Israelis eventually took back the city in 1967, all those houses were demolished. So now when you see pictures of the way wall, it has a huge open plaza in front of it where pilgrims come to visit. But it was a curiosity. Why was it called that? Well, because it was thought to be the last part of the base, not the actual temple, the base of Herod's temple uh, from uh, the, the time uh, before the time of Jesus. So the last vestige, if you like, of the Jewish nation as it had once been before. And of course also, there were lots of people wandering about the territory. Bedouins were commonplace. In 1898, there were lots of Bedouins. They wandered about because it was difficult to find enough for their flocks to feed on. The land wasn't well irrigated at that time. And therefore, they just crossed the borders to and fro without anybody controlling them, really. There were no border posts, indeed, in 1848. There certainly weren't even passports, as we know them today. Something else was happening, though. There were now tourists going for Baidecker, a German guidebook, to actually give you a guide to Jerusalem and to places to visit in the Holy Land. And in their 1898 edition, their guidebook to Palestine and Syria, here are some figures of the population. This is interesting too, you see, because of about 60,000 population in Jerusalem, 41,000, that's two thirds, were Jewish. And again, not everybody appreciates that. 7,000 Jews in Jaffa, 1,500 in Hebron. Interesting enough, none at all that by deputy about in Nazareth, where Jesus has been brought up. So, um, Jewish population had slowly been growing, and some of it had been in Jerusalem. There are some very famous individuals who had a part to play. I don't know if they knew that God was directing that part, but here's one of them. Eliezer ben Yehuda, what did he do? He revived the Hebrew language, which had almost disappeared, or at least diminished, to the point where it was only known by a few scholars of obscure uh, writings. And so he revived the Hebrew language in 1881. If you want a kind of comparison, it's interesting this, because I, when I was growing up, I, didn't, I don't come from Wales, I come from the southwest of England, from Bournemouth. But nobody in Wales, well, hardly anybody, spoke Welsh. A few people around Snowdonia, and that was it. And I can remember, and some of you might be able to, the Welsh nationalists starting to blow up electricity piles and things like that, and eventually succeeded remarkably in reviving the Welsh language. So if you want to go and teach in Wales, you've almost certainly got to be able to do, teach and speak Welsh, and indeed to, 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 to work in the Welsh civil service. Ben Yehuda did much the same for the Hebrew language, and because this was clearly part of God's will. Now, also at a similar time, a little five years later, um, a poem was written by this Naftali Hertz Imber in 1886 called Hatikva. It's interesting this because we didn't know in, in our ecclesia what it meant. So we were talking about this one day at Bible class. I looked it up on, on my phone. And it's quite remarkable. Because here are the words. As long as the Jewish spirit is yearning deep in the heart, the eyes turn toward the east, looking toward Zion, then our hope, 2,000 year old hope, will not be lost, to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. It wasn't until I think about 2002 to 4 that the Israeli state adopted this as its national anthem. So for a long time, this is the, now the Jewish national anthem, written rather obscurely in 1886, but becoming the hope of Israel, the nation, the political nation of Israel, in quite a remarkable way. Now remember earlier I talked about uh, an Austrian journalist who was there at the trial of Alfred J. Dreyfus. He wasn't a particularly religious man. His name was Theodor Herzl. He was a reporter. He'd been sent to cover the trials. 
And when he sat there and listened to the trials and all that was going on about uh, uh, Alfred Dreyfus, he came to the conclusion that it's terrible wrong had been done. And that awoke in him a resolve that he should work with others to find somewhere where Jewish people should be safe from all the persecution which was going on. So he wrote this book in German, Der Judenstadt, uh, a modern uh, answer for the Jewish question, it translates as. And the, what he came up with was there was a need for the Jews to have a homeland of their own. It's interesting, lots of places were offered. In fact, in fact actually, I should have brought with me, because I've acquired one recently, the latest edition of Martin Gilbert's Jewish History Atlas. And on one page of this, I think it's about 18 or 19 different places which were offered as a refuge for the Jews. Places in East Africa, offered by the British government, by the British Empire, places in South America, places in North America, places even in Russia and Austria, all sorts of different places. So lots of places were suggested where Jews might go and find a refuge and be safe. But you see, that wasn't what God had said, was it? And I'm going to bring you back to your own land, to this land, which now is becoming desolate because of your disobedience in the time of Ezekiel. So when they got to the Second Zionist Congress, in 1898 in the Swiss city of Basel, the Zionists agreed there would only be one place that would have to be in the land of Israel. Nowhere else. So all the other offers were going to be rejected because they were going back to the land of Israel. Now, it's interesting, I love this picture. You can see it's a picture of a delegate card for the Second Zionist Congress. And uh, Herr Dr. Bodenheimer is the delegate. So probably a, a German Jew. And you'll notice the pictures on the delegate card rather nicely done, isn't it? There's the Star of David. On the left-hand side, there's what looks to me like the Wailing Wall. Slightly incongruously, there seems to be a nun sitting in the foreground, but there we are. Uh, and in the background, on the right-hand top side, you can see there's a picture of agriculture, because this was the home they would return. Look what God has said, wasn't it? That God was going to make this land fruitful once again. Now, a lot of those delegates who went to Basel, they weren't particularly religious. They were political. They were worried about persecution of their fellow Jews. They didn't necessarily know much about the word of God, and the prophecy of the Old Testament. They probably kept the Passover. There are two things which Jews have always kept. Well, three perhaps. One is the Passover. Practically in every part of Jewry, even the most godless parts of Jew Jewish um, culture, they'd still keep the Passover, commemorating the time when they came out of Egypt. They still circumcise their male children, almost universally. And the third one is, Jewish boys are supposed to marry good Jewish girls. So they kept those three things going, and th those kept things helped to keep the Jewish nation distinct, because this was what God had purpose should be the case. I love this quotation from Herzl about the Basel um, Congress. Basel re-established a Jewish state, if I were to say this aloud today, this is 1898, universal laughter would be the response. It's going to be a Jewish state. In 50 years, everybody will recognize it. Okay. 1898 plus 50 years. 1948, why is that remarkable? Because that's the exact year of the State of Israel being founded. Now, I don't think Herzl was necessarily inspired to write that, but it is a very remarkable coincidence. So, 1898 onwards, what was starting to happen after that? I love this photograph. Apart from anything else, I love the fact they all seem to be in suits and long clothes. It must be quite warm if it's a hot day. And there they are, on sand dunes, near the coast, and they have gathered in April 1909, 66 families to parcel out by lottery the land for a new city to be called Tel Aviv. It's a fantastic, remarkable photograph, that isn't it? Look, look at what it is, sand dunes. I would cause the cities to be inhabited, the waste places shall be rebuilt. You don't get much more waste places than that. But God's purpose was going to be continued. But there was a big snag. In 1909, and for a little while afterwards, the Ottoman Empire was still there. 
And they, they weren't interested particularly now in this. In fact, they, they, they did very little at all about the land. They sometimes sided with Arab, Arabs who nationalists just beginning to appear, who started to object to the Jews returning. But other than that, very little happened. But it didn't look as though anything could happen much while the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, still controlled this land. And then, <clears throat> just over 100 years ago, the First World War came. And that changed everything. Because the Ottoman Empire decided that it would enter the war on the side of Germany. And immediately, in every other part of the world, of those who weren't on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary, hopes grew for change. People began to talk about, what are we going to do when we've defeated the Ottoman Empire? What's going to happen to this land? And all those who read these prophecies began to think, yes, God is working. And things will change, just as the prophecies are, are, are foretold. Now, when the war, as the war was going on, the British government was very keen to take over control of Palestine. It was fairly close to Egypt, and through Egypt ran the Suez Canal, a vital lifeline for the British Empire to its eastern uh, possessions in India and Australia and New Zealand around that area. And then in 1917 and early 1918, the Allies, that is the British and the French, and by that time the Americans just, just joined the war, nearly lost the war. They got so bad that in 1918, in, in, the earlier, in late 1917 into 1918, Christa Delphine fraternal gatherings were either cancelled or they said you have to bring your own food because of rationing. Because German submarines were sinking so much merchant shipping that there was a serious danger that the British uh, side would lose the war. And also what went really badly near the end of the war, near the end of 1917, was the Russian Revolution. There'd be two fronts against the Germans, on one side in France, on the west, and on the east side against Russia. And the Russian front had absorbed a million, literally about a million, German troops. When the Russian Re Revolution took place and eventually withdrew from the war, those troops were available to attack in the West, and they very nearly succeeded in 1918 in winning the war for the Germans. But before that, in the midst of this growing crisis, when the war was going bad in 1917, the British government looked around to find as many friends as it could. The Americans had just about entered the war, they were still a bit ambivalent about how keen they were to fight, but they were starting to appear, and they needed to get as much help as possible. So one of the things the British government thought of was, let's make sure that the Jewish people across the world are on our side, and particularly those in Britain and in the British Empire. How can we do that? We'll issue a declaration which will promise to set up in the land a Jewish homeland. And that's called the Balfour Declaration of November 1917. It was never actually a, a public policy statement by the government. It was rather a private letter to Lord Rothschild, the Jewish leader, from Arthur Balfour, who was, <coughs> who was foreign secretary. So, and you can see it says, I've been grateful to bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Although it partially contradicted promises made to the Arab leaders, particularly promises made by... Uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, who was trying to get the Arabs to revolt on the British side, and went and promised them lots of things as well, partially with government support. Nonetheless, this was a defining moment. And even more so, in 1917, in, in December, Alan Lee, General Alan Lee, uh, liberated Jerusalem. You can see the headline there. That's actually an American newspaper report. Jerusalem is rescued by the British after 673 years of Muslim rule. Great rejoicing in the Christian world. Jews everywhere, in particular, um, see the, the uh, re restoration of Palestine as part of the Allies' tribal program. <coughs> it's a bit small there to read. So, this made a huge step forward for what God had already said would happen. 
And after the war, Palestine was handed over to the British government under a League of Nations mandate. Now, you see the very large mandate stretched right across the borders of Iraq, covered the whole of what's, what's now Jordan and some parts of Syria besides. And it's in that area that the British government was going to set up the Jewish homeland. Again, some of these were lines on a map, that's why they're straight. They weren't, you know, literally, someone got a map and said, I think we'll put it there. I didn't mean anything, because there are most places you wouldn't have found any border posts on those lines at all, or very little, and certainly not most of it. So, as had happened before, there is put different populations across that part of the, the, the uh, Middle East without much hindrance at all. So let's just take stock of how far we've got with our promises. There we are. The land would be desolate. They were dispossessed by the enemies. Yes, we saw that happen. Jewish people would start to return. Well, that was beginning to happen in a small way, but not quite completely. God would bring back the Jewish people from every place which they'd been scattered. Yes, also it happened in a small way. That power, God's power would be shown. And lastly, the people of Israel would return to God's ways and God's kingdom be established. Now, very quickly, we're going to scamper through the, the years since 1970. What happened? Well, uh, at first, the British policy was to allow Jewish migration. There was a lot of Jewish settlements set up fairly quickly. Not large numbers of Jews coming into the land, as we'll see in a moment, but they improved the land. They bought Arab farms. The Arab, the Arab landowners thought they were a rather a good thing, actually, because along came these Jews, many of them backed by substantial sums of money, raised from countries where they previously lived, Germany, Britain, America, places like that, and they paid decent money. Sometimes they bought marshland, and the Arab owners, I think, thought, well, they'd be a bit dark, they can do that. But they proved, some of them, pretty good at draining marshes, and there you can see the working party working to help to irrigate the land. These are the figures in thousands for the uh, immigration of Jews into Palestine between 1920 and 1945. You can see not very many to start with, 8,000 a year for several years, 13,000, 34,000 in 1925. Back down at 1.22,000 in about 1927, 28 there. But then rapidly increasing when the Germans, can, when the Nazis control, uh, started to gain control in Germany and rising to a peak in 1935. Uh, after which it became rather more difficult to leave for quite a while, until just before the war, you see 1939, more tried to leave there. The population of Palestine, as it was still called, grew very rapidly. It more than doubled, I think, amongst the Arabs in 20 years. Now, this is an interesting thing. Some of the Arabs who now say they were dispossessed and still claim they were dispossessed have not lived there, despite what they say today, for the number of generations they <coughs> claim. In fact, many, many of them had migrated into this area uh, during the period of Jew the British mandate from 1917 to 1947. Ironically, one of the reasons why they'd gone there was because with the growing Jewish settlement, there was good work and decent pay. Some of the Jewish um, settlers who came were academics and thinkers. They weren't very good at digging. And they could buy fairly cheaply, but at better wages than perhaps one offer previously, Palestinian Arab help to actually dig their fields and help set up their settlements. And there's no doubt at all that a significant number of Palestinians moved into this area during this period of 30 years. At the same time, the Jewish population went up but somewhat more slowly, but gradually, Arab opposition which had begun because, you remember, we said that during the First World War, the British government, I'm afraid, did not do very much honour, offered to Jews one set of promises and to Arabs another set of promises, some of which applied to the same piece of land. And Jewish duplicity was not terribly honourable uh, in, in the, as the war was finishing. But then, of course, the British government felt we've got the war to win, so we'll do it by any means possible. <coughs> By the mid-1930s, the Arabs were getting very upset by the number of Jewish immigrants coming in. They led, a Jewish, they led an Arab revolt against the British. 
And the British troops who were stationed there suddenly found themselves under fire uh, from the Arabs. And as the Jewish settlers got more militant and more worried about their position from Jewish, um, Jewish militia as well, Erdogan was one of them. And there were attacks on Jewish settlers, there were attacks on uh, British troops. The whole thing was taking place at the same time as the final solution to the Jewish problem, as it was called amongst the Nazis and by Hitler, was beginning to swing into action. So the Jews were beginning to be rounded up, they were beginning to be shipped out to camps where eventually they were, sadly, so many of them exterminated. And uh, the British government, in response, under Arab pressure, planned to reduce Jewish immigration to only 15,000 a year, and eventually it's going to stop it altogether. So we can't be terribly proud of the British government's policy at that time, particularly when so much persecution was being renewed in such a savage way in uh, Europe. You'll see there on the screen another Bible prophecy. This one goes right back to the time of Moses, from Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will give you their trembling heart and failing eyes and languishing soul. You don't to say in the morning, you say, which good God it was evening, and the evening good God that it was morning, because this was a terrible time. I'm not going to go through these figures because they're very complicated and you can see an awful lot of them, but I would draw your attention to one thing. The percentage of the Jewish population killed in certain countries. Poland, 91% of 3,300,000 killed. That's 3 million people killed. In uh, Hungary, 74%. In Romania, 84%. In Lithuania, 85%. In Latvia, 84%, and so it goes on. In Greece, 87%. A total of 6 million Jews in all. An enormous number of Jews killed in this terrible uh, Holocaust. What have God said? Your life shall hang tight before you night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. After the war was ended, you would have thought, wouldn't you, that many Jews let out of the concentration camps would have actually been allowed into Palestine. But the British government didn't want to do that. They were so far by this time, as the British Foreign Office has been pretty continuously since then, under the influence of Arab and pro-Palestinian groups, that they didn't want Jews to go there. So they tried to stop them. So old ships were hired by the Jewish federations and, and the Zionist federations and packed with refugees from Europe and sent to land on the beaches of, of uh, Palestine. And sometimes the British government did as they're doing there. British soldiers uh, boarding the ship, trying to turn them around and send them back to, to Cyprus or indeed perhaps even back to Europe where they'd been so persecuted. This was not a popular process. Jewish resistance grew. Arab resistance grew, the British government in the middle of it, and eventually in 1947, the British government said, we've had enough, we go to go. So the newly formed United Nations said, we're going to do something about this, what are we going to do? Well, we'll have to divide the land between Jews and Arabs. We'll have two states. And that was the map we originally set up. And of course, the proposal did not come to pass because the Arab leaders said, there is no way we are going to accept this. We will resist this to the utmost. <coughs> the British government said, well, um, we're going anyway. And almost literally withdrew in May 1948, boarded the ships and left, leaving the Arabs and the Jews to fight this out between them. Which was pretty much what happened straight away. So the State of Israel was born uh, on uh, the 14th of May 1948. What God said, read it didn't read it, Ezekiel 36, you shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers. Yes, God had determined what should happen. The um, new state was attacked the next day. What do we read in Ezekiel? I swear that the nations around about you shall themselves suffer reproach. Why? Because they had rejoiced centuries earlier and every time possible ever since in the misfortunes of the Jews. Way back in the book of Genesis, and this is worth going back to when we've got more time than we have to, today. Look at the promises to Abraham. I'm going to make of you a great nation. You'll be the father of many peoples. I'm going to give you this land. Where was he? He was in uh, Shechem, right in the middle of what's now the West Bank. 
<coughs> um, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in your descendant, and this comes to the Lord Jesus, all the families of the earth should be blessed. So this is what happened. So the Jewish nation was born out of this attack by 1949 and occupied more territory than the Jews given. <coughs> now what's happened since then? Well, the, the state has survived. It's, it's been thriving after a fashion. It's had a, a substantial population growth. I'm sorry this isn't as clear as I'd like it to be, but you'll see the graph there. The population of Israel has grown enormously. They stress to us eight and a half million, some of whom are Arabs because they actually live within the boundaries of the state. What did God say? I'll multiply men upon you the whole house of Israel all of them. This picture is really interesting. Well, it's sad in I'll tell you why it's sad in a minute. Why is it interesting? Because somewhere amongst those, amongst those high-rise buildings are the sand dunes you saw those families on in 1909. What did God say? They will say the land was desolate to become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now inhabited in 45. Why is it sad? Because Brother Chris Brooks tells me that sadly Tel Aviv is the gay capital of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. How sad that is, and how much it shows that actually the Jewish people still have a long way to go to change their hearts back to God's ways. This is nice too, isn't it? Look at that. Everywhere you go in Israel, and I haven't been recently, the last time I was there, about 50 years ago, um, but it's irrigated. And therefore, it has become prosperous in a farming sense. The land that was desolate should be tilled instead of being desolated, and it should pass the side of water and pass by. And there is the proof. And this one I love particularly. This is a verse we didn't read in chapter 36. I'll make the fruit of the tree and increase the field abundant. There's a Jewish market full of produce, I would guess, all of it from Israel, mm -hmm. grown in Israel, fruits and so on, which belong to the land today. And if you go to Tesco or wherever you go, mm -hmm. you can find some of those fruits from Israel, uh, it probably on the shelves, mm -hmm. despite some Palestinian you know, attempts to have a boycott. So there we are, you see, this is what's happened. The prophecies are, are being fulfilled. There's still no peace um, since the Balfour Declaration. There have been four wars, there have been intifadas, there's the Palestinian Declaration of Statehood in 2011. There are constant riots going on, particularly on the border of Gaza. And every Friday for now a year and a bit, they have been uh, campaigning, uh, ostensibly, they say, for their return to the territories they claim they had before. Historically, not a very accurate claim at all. This is an awfully sad picture when I look at it because this is Jerusalem Day. And on Jerusalem Day, the Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem process through the streets of the old city to underline what they believe is their biblical right to that city. Except you look at the little boy, it's not a very happy occasion, is it? It's not a happy occasion because it isn't yet completed the restoration of God's people. <coughs> Instead, there is the wall. I'd forgotten about Leila Khaled, pictured there when she was very much younger, about 1963 or so. She was one of the original uh, hijackers of the planes to Jordan. She's still alive today, I'm told. And instead of this being a place where there is peace, at the moment, it is, as another prophecy revived in Zechariah 12 foretold, a burdensome stone, a heavy stone for all peoples. And they watch anxiously the nations of the world to see what's happened. That's why two weeks ago, when Benjamin Netanyahu was re-elected, promising this time to make the settlements in the West Bank a full part of the state of Israel, there was considerable disquiet in Western capitals. And the fact that Donald Trump has made Jerusalem, the, has, has accepted it as the capital of Israel, also controversial, and... Uh, his next actions may be even more controversial, but he is seen by the Israelis as being very firmly in their camp. So, what's going to happen? Well, there is to be a change to the people of Israel's attitude to God. 
Daniel and Zechariah go out to the house of David and have this truth and the spirit of compassion and supplication. So when they look on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. Who is the one who is pierced? Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected, they said, We have no king but Caesar. They rejected Jesus, but they will change, have a change of heart. Uh, when he comes back to the earth, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, weep bitterly over him as one weeps over the firstborn. What's then going to happen finally? God will establish the city of Jerusalem as the centre of God's kingdom. It's the promise. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains, and all nations shall flow to it. It's God's city, Jerusalem, Zion. Then many people say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, that we may teach us his ways. And out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So there we are. That's a pretty good record so far, isn't it? And the last one about the change of heart of the nation of Israel will take place, we believe, pretty soon. We don't know exactly how. There's evidence that there will be a defeat for the people of Israel. They will find great difficulties. It's perhaps in those circumstances they have turned back to God. So this is where it's going to end. I'm told that the thing which the Israeli security forces fear most of all is someone blowing up the Dome of the Rocks. Because they know that, that would bring literally Armageddon uh, in, in, into the land and uh, a fierce conflict between the Jews and Arabs. We can do that, you know, that's what it says, isn't it? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of salvation. Because until God has established his kingdom in Jerusalem, there can be no peace in the world as a whole. And this is the hope, which is the hope of Israel. And this is the hope which we as Christadelphians believe, and which we exhort you to take up and to believe, to repent and be baptized into Christ Jesus, and might be heirs of the same promise as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob.